improve the agenda. So we can take a look. The uh, you know most of this meeting is a, is is dedicated to the public hearing on the proposed zoning changes. Uh, we also have an update from Marcella and John and company. Stephanie, I think, is the company. I'll move to approve the agenda. Okay, great. Give me a second. Uh, second. Second by John. All in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Okay. Agenda approved. Uh, so moving on, we have comments from the chair. I do have a couple of things I'd like to comment on tonight. The first is, uh, you know, I was really impressed with the way that everyone responded when John brought up the parking issue. And uh, I think that I'm going to, you know, take that cue and have us do more of that. I think that, you know, I've, I've taken it really slowly and trying to like push any kind of agenda since I've been the chair. But that doesn't mean I haven't had I don't have a whole list of things that that I think would be great for us to consider, um, and I and I realize that I've been doing this for I think a year and a half now. So I think the time might be where we start adding some more discussions like this to the agenda. It seemed like everyone was really responsive, and, and we can get a lot done. So you should all expect from me, uh, you know, items added to the agenda that are similar to this parking issue, like issues where we can, you know do some changes to the zoning potentially if the group wants to and have a discussion about that. So in other words, I plan to be a little bit more active. I also invite anyone to reach out to me about adding items to the agenda. So if any of you have a similar thing that you'd like for us to talk about and possibly act on, uh, let's do it. Um, I think the only criteria I would ask is that you have a concrete idea of what you would like us to do. Um, if it's if it's too amorphous, it may not be very productive. But if you say, you know, in in this case with the parking, you have an idea like I think that we should, you know, remove the remaining parking requirements in the zoning, then that's that's a concrete thing for us to talk about. So um, hopefully everybody is uh, on board with that idea. Um, and if and if not, let me know if you have any concerns about what I'm talking about. And you can do that offline or during this meeting. Um, do we have any reactions to that? If not, I can move on to my other thing. Okay. Uh, so the, the other thing uh, that I wanted to bring up was um, for us to make sure that we're getting together and organizing and doing our subcommittee work. And I've been guilty here too. I need to schedule for the two subcommittees I'm on. I need to schedule some meetings because it's, it's been a while and we, we haven't done anything. So just as a reminder for everyone to try to meet and discuss and try to get some more product if possible out of those things. Um, it's just, I'm just bringing it up now because, uh, you know, as a group, we did, we had decided that this is like how we want to proceed. And so I don't want us to uh, lose our momentum that we had in, in deciding to do it this way. So, um, so yeah, let's just make sure that we, we meet and, and then get back to the bigger commission soon. Um, and I think that's, that's all I've got to say. Does anyone else have anything to bring to the group? Planning commissioners? Okay. If I oh, may, uh, just oh, go very quickly, um, I have to be personal friends with Barbara Conry, so I just texted her and she said she's trying to join but is having trouble with uh, the link. So I have forwarded uh, Mike's uh, email to me to provide the link and hopefully she'll be able to join shortly. But she's assured me she's trying. Just FYI. Let's see. Yeah, In fact, you. she just, uh, she says she's not receiving email. Well, Maybe I can figure out how to text her the link. Anyway, I will try to do this. We'll see. But she may be having just internet problems. I don't know. But anyway, she just texts and says she's not receiving email either. So for whatever it's worth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's definitely missing here. I mean, I think. Yeah, I wonder if she yeah. doesn't have internet connection. I wonder if that's why she's not able to get emails or make the link work if her, her internet is down. Just guessing.
Um, yeah. So yeah, hopefully she can get that sorted out and join us as we move along. Well, the next item on our agenda is uh, general business from the public. Uh, the only person who's not a commissioner or staff here is uh, is David. So David, you didn't have you. I take it you're here for the hearing. You're not here for something else. So that's good. Uh, so moving along, uh, we have to consider the minutes from December. 14th so everyone can take a look at what Mike sent can I just say that December 14th feels like a lifetime ago Second. I'll second that too. <laughs> yeah, uh, can I just ask a question? Are we going to talk about the parking thing again today? Is it part of the hearing as this no. just? Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's part of the hearing, which means that uh, if we decide to do something, then it will go with all of the other recommendations to the city council. I wonder if Barb could call in just via one of those phone numbers. You, One of these phone numbers works, right, Mike? Yeah. If she is having full internet, maybe she can call. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, if someone could try to let her know through through text. Maybe David, you could do that. Let her know to use the call in number. The, the meeting ID and the passcode. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve the minutes. Motion by Marcella. Do we have a second? <clears throat> I'll second. Second by Stephanie. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes from December 14th, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Okay, minutes approved. <clears throat> which brings us to the uh the public hearing uh for rose zoning changes this goes back a little way so there's a number of things that probably feel even more ancient than december 14th that we will go over um with that i'll hand it off to mike so he can brief us on on everything just to jump back up all right so um the hearing was going to be broken into just a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to go over a summary and then we'll go through some questions. We won't necessarily have to have the public questions. Um, it doesn't look like we'll have any public, um, but I did want to go through the summary because this is going to be on ORCA and it is going to get broadcast and taped. So we should go through and summarize everything in case someone else is taking a look at this at a later time. Um, and then we can, after we've gotten through our questions, we can have that conversation about the minimum parking standards. So, um, and then finally, at the end, if we, if we are ready, we can vote tonight to send this to city council, or we can have another hearing scheduled. We can make that decision afterwards. But let me quickly... Go through this. Uh, let's see if I can. And so that should work. Let me know if there's anything not working. Um, 
So the areas of primary change, so this proposed zoning update uh, is really broken into three groups of changes. We've got the savings related pieces, we've got housing related pieces, and one of these, one part is due to statutory requirements. There were some statutory changes in the legislature last year, and we have to make changes to our bylaws to, to reflect that. And some other parts are housing related, but are not statutory re requirements, but made sense to do them now, because we, we are talking about making some changes to housing, we might as well make these other ones. And then there are a number of um, miscellaneous changes, and I will go through them. Mostly are minor and technical um, in nature. So the savings related pieces, there are three. We have section 3303, which is traffic, um, the conditional use traffic. And below you'll see there's also subdivision traffic. So the, the and I'm not going over them in, in word for word strikeout detail. I'm just gonna give a high level summary of what the changes are. Um, yeah. Primary, what was that? So, okay. So primarily the uh, three, the traffic was about the removal of the level of service as a requirement. And it was organized to clean up kind of what is a requirement, what's a guideline. We kind of made sure we understood what's the overriding requirement that has to be met and, and how, how do you meet those are some of the guidelines. So it was, we kind of cleaned that up a bit. In section 3404B, that is the new neighborhood PUDs. Um, Did I check that one? Okay, I'm sorry. Ah, we got Barb, or at least I can hear yeah, her. Yeah, sorry. You've only got me by phone. I don't know what happened. I think I made the fatal mistake of accepting the invitation. And uh, anyway, I'll listen in. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we just started the public hearing. Uh, we don't have any members of the public here except for uh, David White. So uh, I was just going through a quick summary of what were the changes. And so I mentioned that there are three sections, one of which is the savings related changes, uh, which are the 3303, the traffic changes that we made. Section 3404, that are the neighborhood PUD changes, which only change the applicability to exempt riverfront district. Um, and also made a technical change of kind of replacing urban center one, which didn't apply anyways. So uh, really the new neighborhood PUD is not changed at all. We just exempted riverfront district properties from that neighbor, from that PUD as a requirement. Uh, and third, uh, the third change was 3504 traffic, which uh, is in the subdivision. And all we did was matched it to the, the conditional use standard rather than restating the requirements because um, previously our two standards were slightly different. Uh, under the required housing related pieces, uh, they are in section 1203, which is about non conforming parcels. Um, non conforming parcels are your grandfathered parcels. So if you were in a district that has, um, say, a requirement that has the property has to be 6,000 square feet, if your property was only 3,000 square feet, this rule explains what you can do on your property. And, and in this case, what state law says is that any parcel with access to water and wastewater must be allowed to be developed under state law regardless of size. So even if you were in a district that required two acre minimum lot size and you had a 1,000 square foot lot, um, you know, which is substantially smaller, if it has sewer and water, it would be eligible to be developed. Um, and that's what the state law said. And so the changes basically reflect that. Um, the second set of house required housing changes were figure 2-15, which is our use table. It's a big table that's at the end of part two. And um, what, was what was required under state law is that any development of one unit to four unit buildings so that's you know a, a single family house to a quad apartment can no longer be denied for character of the area. 
um, which is a requirement that's under conditional use. So you can't use character of the area as a reason to deny a one unit to four unit project. Um, and because of that, we propose to, to change any of those from conditional use to, per, to permitted uses. Um, and that's really just because if you can't deny it for character of the area, there's really not going to be a reason to deny it for conditional use. So it makes sense to make those permitted uses. Um, the third set of changes from the, from the state law changes last year were to accessory dwelling units. We were mostly already more generous with our ADUs than state law, but there were a couple of small pieces that we had to catch up to, one of which is um, that uh, under our zoning, we only allowed studio or one bedroom apartments as ADUs and under the new state law, any size um, can now be required. So we had to remove those studio and one, bed one bedroom limitations. So you can now have a two bedroom ADU or a three bedroom ADU as long as you meet the other requirements. So what was not required um, that are housing related? Um, we've had this discussion in the office um, since 2018, when the zoning went through, we started to notice there were a couple of inconsistencies with the way residential uses were classed um, and created gaps and inconsistencies. For example, room and board is a specific use in section three, but is not on the use table in section two. So we had a couple of these ones that kind of showed up in these different places and there were gaps. Um, so you, you would have uses that or overlaps of things. You'd have congregate living and senior housing, but some senior housing is congregate living. And, you know, if you had a four unit building that was senior housing, is that a four unit building or is that senior housing? And it, and it started, there's just places where it didn't make sense. So we went through and reclassified into three groups. So all residential uses will now fall into either regulation by dwelling units, um, so that's a one unit building, two unit building, three unit building, four unit building, or multifamily. So those are all by dwelling units. And another group is congregate living. And then the third group are specific uses of groups and residential care homes, which are specific state licensed residential uses. So we really couldn't drop them into either one. They really have to be treated on their own. Um, so the dwelling units, that first group, are those residential units that independently contain all requirements for a dwelling unit. So there are a number of them in the definition that talk about having to have a kitchen and a bathroom and, um, and living space. Um, whereas a congregate living arrangement is a residential use where you share one of one or more of those requirements. So if you've got a living arrangement where people uh, share kitchen facilities. So you might rent, um, a, live in a dorm room, but eat in a, in a, in a group kitchen. Um, well, that, that would be a congregate living. Dorm, dormitory living would be congregate living. Um, so that's, that's the difference between the two. So there are a number of rooming and boarding is a congregate living type of arrangement because usually you're renting rooms, which you can live in independently, and then you share the kitchen facilities. Sometimes you'll share the bathroom facilities. It really depends on how the arrangement is set up. So that's the difference between the, the major groups of dwelling units and congregate living. And many of your different, um, some of your senior living may end up as a congregate living, some of them may end up as a dwelling unit, but we no longer look at senior living as a separate use. Um, so because we rearranged these and made these changes, um, which the housing task force supports, they, they supported this new arrangement. These changes led to a number of other places where residential uses appear in the document that needed to be changed. Um, so figure 215, we had to rename the housing uses, uses and 3.3002D, uh, that talks about density. That's how you calculate density. It's adjusted to reference the section 3111 um, and changes how density is calculated for congregate living. So that became a challenge, how to calculate density for congregate living. And we adjusted it to be uh, using FAR instead of density, which works much better. 
Um, figure 313 renamed housing, so that's the parking. Figure 313 is about parking. So if, if, it, if parking stays, we would then have to adjust our parking table to make sure it talks about the dwelling units and congregate living. Um, 3107 added residential care homes and group homes as they are both protected under the law. So 3107 used to only talk about group homes and we added residential care homes into that same section. And 3111 used to be rooming and boarding. We struck that and replaced it with a discussion of residential uses generally. So that was another change. And the last set of changes for housing really just came down to definitions. Obviously, when you make all these changes, we had to remove a bunch of definitions. Um, there was one policy change that, that we kind of went through. And I think, I know John, we had talked about this in the past. Um, there was a requirement for dwelling units that said you had to be a minimum of 250 square feet. Um, in light of a lot of the conversations about tiny homes and everything else, uh, and it, it doesn't seem like it, there's a overwhelming use to keep that in there. So I was just gonna recommend striking, remove the minimum 250 square foot requirement. Uh, rooming and boarding, skilling, add, we had to add a definition for congregate living and we had to amend a definition of household because now that term only applies to dwelling units. So I'm gonna to try to be quick about what are the miscellaneous ones. Um, minor fixes to transition areas for buffers on the natural resource map. So we have an amended natural resource map that's a part of this application. Um, it's just, they're very minor transition areas. If somebody really is interested, I can show them to them. Um, it's just a funky thing of the GIS as to how it had mapped it originally and we had to fix it. Um, we had to fix the design review boundary and district and neighborhood boundaries on the zoning map that were incorrectly mapped in September 2020. So that's up on Terrace Street. We were supposed to remove two properties and we, for whatever reason, when we did the GIS map, it removed five. So we got to put those three back to where they belonged. Um, we had discussed all the maps and looked at all the maps, but the map that was actually warned was wrong. So. We had all looked at other maps that were correct, but the map that was in the hearing document was wrong, and therefore we have to readopt to fix that. Some other changes, um, again, these are just random miscellaneous things that have come up as a result of projects. One is applicability. So 1004 is, is really what needs to have a zoning permit. Um, and we have, and point B added a requirement that removal of vegetation in certain areas, such as wetlands and riparian buffers, triggers a zoning permit. So what we found is there's just a random, if all somebody is doing is removing vegetation, it technically doesn't trip a zoning permit it, unless they've already ha had a project there and it's a condition. So somebody, unless, you know, if somebody has a project um, or, or has not had a project and has, has riparian buffer on their property or has a wetland on their property, and all they're going to do is go in and cut down the vegetation on the wetland, it actually isn't a violation of our zoning because it doesn't actually trigger the need for a permit. So we just needed to add language that says if you're going to remove the, then you need a zoning permit, and therefore we can either give a notice of violation or deny the application. Um, section 1301 adds rules um, regarding reasonable accommodations for ADA. So we didn't really have a process for these reasonable accommodation requests, but there was a discussion on the VPA listserv about these uh, and, and the zoning administrator and I discussed it. We really thought that was appropriate and, and good. We didn't take the ones that were online, but we took the spirit of it and kind of really drafted some, some rules that we think were good and appropriate and help to guide somebody if they have a reasonable accommodation request. We now have a process that says in these cases it's administrative and the zoning administrator can simply approve it. In other cases, it has to go to the DRB for them to, to work on making the approval. Uh, figure 310 is just a technical fix. Uh, there's just threshold requirements in the left column of this table that says everything is greater than or equal to, but when you look in the right-hand columns, it's only talking about greater than. So we just had to make sure it matched that if it's talking about greater than or equal to in the left column, it's talking about greater than or equal to in the right column. So um, 
3201L uh, changes sign requirements to strike a provision that reviews content, which is now unconstitutional. So there is a uh, there was a Supreme Court case that said you can't review content, and we had this section in 3012L that talked about very expressly talked about you should review this content, and so we know that's not legal anymore. So we struck it. 3101E is striking a provision that allows eight foot fences on class one highways. Um, it was in, it's allowed in other places, but I don't think the intent was to allow them on class one highways, which could be um, Main Street. Um, you know, the class one highways are, are, are a lot of the main routes through town. And I don't think we would be wanting eight foot stent, um, fences um, and fences generally fall under permitted uses, so it would be very difficult. So the only place eight foot fences are allowed is um, if you have a property that abuts I-89, um, you can have an eight foot fence. Uh, 3105 changes the title to match the content. So it was a, the title of 3105 is home occupations, but inside that talked about home offices, not home occupations. So we just changed the title Outdoor seating applicability changes to apply to patrons. So we had an issue in 3205, which is about outdoor seating, where somebody was just coming out to put a bench. It wasn't for patrons, um, but they had to go and meet all these requirements for patrons. All the rules are really talking about, you know, customers. Um, but if somebody just put a, a seat a, or, you know, something for uh, public enjoyment, then it, it still had to meet those requirements. So we just made an adjustment to have those outdoor seating requirements really apply to projects that are addressing patrons. Uh, 3301A clarifies applicability of conditional use. Um, uh, oh, because the 3301 just said these, it, it's really the applicability for conditional use and it says anything on, in part two or on the, the, the use table needs to meet these requirements, but there are a number of places with reference to to that. So this is really just a cleanup to refer to the fact that there are other places where you may end up needing to do conditional use review as well. Um, and we added river hazard areas to the natural resource requirements for new subdivisions. So part of our NFIP requirements is we are supposed to have uh, minimize uh, projects and impacts on river hazard areas. Um, and they aren't addressed in our river hazard regulations because they were supposed to be addressed in our zoning and subdivision regulations, but we didn't. So we just added them in here. Um, probably won't make a big difference in most projects. And then lastly, we had to change a number of definitions or we had to change a couple of definitions, one of which was for accessory structures. And the definition of accessory structures refers to um, items that are detached. But if you look throughout the zoning, we have a number of attached accessory structures. So you know, it was kind of an oxymoron to have an excess and an attached accessory structure when by definition, accessory structures are only detached. So we struck detached from the accessory structure definition. So that is a quick, or as quick as I can make it, summary of the changes and certainly we'll go back to taking some questions here, but if there's a member of the public who is viewing this at another time and is interested in asking questions, you can email me at mmiller at montpelier-vt.org and I can answer whatever questions you have. These are also all located online. On, if you go to the main page for the city website, you will find that uh, there is a link um, on the left-hand column near the bottom, and it'll have the proposed zoning regulations, and you can click on that, and it will give you copies of all the documents, the new natural hazard map, the new zoning map, uh, an abbreviated version, which is usually the easiest one to kind of get through because um, it is just a printout of the pages where there are changes in the zoning, strikeout copies, and um, you can review them there. So I guess I will turn it back over to Kirby for... Um, the next step of just taking questions and comments from anyone. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. Um, yeah, that was that was quite a lot of uh, like technical stuff there. Uh, 
I guess for, for background to remind us, you talked about a number of things. Um, I had actually, over the last few months, I've missed a meeting or two. So uh, it's possible some, cause some of it was new to me is, is all, is some of that material supposed to be new to us? Like, cause it seemed like some of it was technical changes that you've made administratively. Uh, a couple of them, a couple of the miscellaneous ones may be, may be new to you guys, or, or we didn't get into them very much because a couple of them were technical. As I said, the only, the only policy changes that were really in miscellaneous one was the removal of the 250 square feet um for the dwelling unit definition um the change of the fencing um the eight foot fencing and that was just one that was noticed by the zoning administrator um she was like i don't think that's really what the planning commission had intended when they wrote this but officially people can have eight foot stockade fences on main street if they wanted it and well not in downtown, you have to go through design review, but um, in other places, Route 12, you could put in a eight foot stockade fence on the property line. Um, and so I don't think that was our intention when we wrote that. Um, so I don't think there were too many others that were real policy that really affected the policy of things. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I wasn't thinking that they were very policy heavy. I was um, just clarifying that uh, in case there were other planning commissioners who thought, I don't remember that. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, some of this is a little bit new to us. Um, yeah, just so do we have questions? For any of the items? Mike went over. Okay. Do we have any, uh, I mean, do we have any discussion over any of these items or is there anything that anyone saw that gave them concern? Okay. So we have a uh, very timid hearing right now then. Uh, David, did you have anything being a member of the public? No, I'm mostly here to listen. And um, if there are any issues that come up, I'm happy to offer my two cents worth, but not hearing any currently, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you for asking. I mean, I think, I think part of the reason that like for many of these things, we have gone over them before. And as Mike was just saying, uh, a few that we haven't were, were mostly technical. And I, I didn't personally have any issue with it. I think what Mike did was wise. Uh, cause you're, you're, you're related to the, uh, the traffic changes, right? Like you've, you worked on something similar to that. So again, just um, to remind people, I represent the, yeah. uh, the, the, the city is my client on this and, uh, my particular, uh, role is related to the Sabin's pasture project. So it's both the traffic related and the, uh, PUD related provisions that, uh, um, I'm here to support. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's pretty, pretty well settled from, from what we decided to do with that. So, um, okay. So, so again, before we move on, I'll ask, uh, does anyone have anything about any of the items Mike went over? If not, we'll move on to the parking. That was what I was going to ask about. I was going to say, did I miss the parking or what? Yeah, okay. Nope. Uh, uh, yes, anyone? Barb? Did you have something? Hi. Uh, I was asking if you had something because your your phone logo just popped up on my screen. And no. I... Sorry. No, nope, I don't. Okay. Not a note, because we've already discussed them, um, for the most part. There were a few surprises for me, too, but, um, you know, I understand that a lot of that was um, administrative. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, with that, we, uh, we'll, we'll let it go. Thanks a lot, Mike. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about the parking requirements. Um, I'll, 
I'll try to give my attempt at a background and then let Mike or John take over. Um, Cause this is, was suggested by John in our last meeting, which was about a month ago. Uh, so we are considering removing what remains of the parking requirements in our zoning. Um, for, for many residential uses, they've already been removed, but there are some that remain. And we're, we've questioned, uh, or at least some of us have questioned whether it's useful to have that and whether it's actually meeting the policy goals intended and whether it's good planning. Uh, so with that, uh, if Mike or John, either one of you guys wanna, wanna come in and start the discussion. May I just inquire quickly, because um, are you intending to take, uh, to have any kind of motion on the zoning changes that Mike talked about tonight? Uh, yeah. The hearing, I'm just trying to decide whether it's worth my staying in this meeting or not. <laughs> I yeah, mean, that's fascinating great. as it is. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's looking like now that we're going to, I mean, it looks like we're going to approve those. I mean, there's been no, no one's voiced any concern with any of them. So, um, unless something totally unforeseeable happens to you know by my estimate we're we're going to approve those we may also add to them a, a removal of the parking requirements in the okay. as well okay ah uh, i had i kind of object to that in terms of if if we were to add that now without further discussion i think that's premature um right you know everything so, else has been discussed Right. So that just that's the intent is that that discussion is going to take place right now at this at this meeting. Um, and, and because that's why I mean, this is my understanding too. To, uh, and anyone correct if it's if there's anything procedurally incorrect, but it's why Mike put it on the agenda the way that he did so that we would have the option of making some change to the parking because it was it was warranted as part of this discussion. Um, um, my only question is, um, Mike, you offered to let folks who are watching this later provide feedback after the fact. Would that, if we voted now, would that kind of make that feedback moot, or um, can we incorporate? They would need to bring. They would need to bring the feedback to the to the city council. Oh, I see. Okay. Because, because it would not be too late to to for someone to provide feedback after after seeing what we've said. Because there's the next step. Okay, of course. Thank you. Yeah. But if the public does have questions or does have comments, they can they can still contact me, whether it's in the Planning Commission's court or whether it's the City Council's. Um, they can contact me about questions and comments. And if it happens to be going to City Council, then they can also contact their counselor to go through and say, I support this or I don't support this. Okay. Um, so that would be their choice. Okay, great. Thanks. So I guess I can, I'll just throw in really quick, um, what we're talking about in parking is in section 3011. That is where almost all of the parking requirements exist or in that one section, um, page 3-22 in my, in my version of the regulations. So anyone either at home or any of the planning commissioners wanted to look that up, that's where it is. Um, and so the one question I have, I guess I'll, I'll ask John is, is your request to remove the parking requirements, um, and, uh, minimum parking requirements entirely for all uses or just for the residential uses? I would advocate for it being for all uses. Okay. Yeah, so that everyone knows, uh, along with the Zoom invite tonight, uh, Mike sent us a link to additional documents. And one of those documents would be draft zoning changes abbreviated. Uh, and These so probably to... wouldn't be in the abbreviated version. Hmm? These would not be in the abbreviated version because I don't I've... think we have proposed changes in this section. Uh, well, I found it in that document. Um, oh, unless I'm looking at the incorrect thing, it's uh, on page 10 of that document is where 3011, well, that's part of 3011. It actually starts earlier than that in the document, but there's, there's the 
figure 313 minimum parking ratios table. Yes, so I think. Look, okay. Okay, so that does show just just the minimum ratios table. So earlier in the in that chapter, there's three zero one one point C, which talks about the minimum amount of parking requirement. So what we would probably do, because we had talked um, previously about if if we did this, then we lose some of our our strength on being able to regulate because currently we have a minimum and a maximum parking. And so people have to fall in between those two um, guardrails for the amount of parking that they have. If they wanna have more than the maximum amount of parking, then they have to go to the DRV and justify it. So if we removed our minimums, we would no longer have the maximums because the maximums are double the minimum. So if you were required to have two parking spaces and you, you know, wanted to have five then that's more than double so you'd have to go to the drb so um, what we would have to do to figure 313 would be probably to double all those numbers and change the title of it to say maximum parking ratios so that way if we wanted to maintain that maximum parking requirement we would just keep this same table just adjust it to say maximum and you know finagle with the numbers on the in inside that's that would be my suggestion if we wanted to remove minimums but keep maximums we would make an adjustment to that table so there there are ways of working around um that to do it um the, the policy side i guess is is you know whether we should is is a separate policy question i think there are ways of making it work in the zoning to do that mike can i ask a question about that before we move on if we make that maximum, um, but then um, say for financing reasons or what else, if a developer is required to put in more units and sorry, more parking, then they would have to apply for a waiver or variance um, uh, in order to do that. In section D, section D of that of that um, talks about maximum amount of parking. Creation of more than twice the minimum parking, so we would have to just adjust that to say creation of um, parking greater than what's on figure 313 shall be approved by the DRB in accordance with the following, that the applicant shall submit a parking study demonstrating that additional parking is necessary and that the development review, review board may condition approval of any parking in excess of the minimum on the additional area being surfaced with pervious materials and being phased so that the construction only as warranted to meet future demands. So they have options for conditions. Those aren't requirements, but the DRB can look at what is talked about in that parking study. Um, and it's, it's clearly left vague. There aren't really good standards in there. Um, you know, I don't think we spent a lot of time talking about these when these were presented to us and well, there's probably 2015, 2016. So there's probably room for making some improvements to that section to give it, give it some guidelines. What is, what is the DRB using to make that determination? Um, right now, I don't see a lot in there that would give the DRB the ability to say no. Um, usually you want to have something that's to, to, to be able to put your thumb on to say, nope, you didn't meet that requirement. Um, seems to be as long as you have a parking study demonstrating that you need it, that the DRB really doesn't have grounds to deny it. Um, I guess our, our attorneys on the board can <laughs> opine yeah. on that, but that'd be my, my thought. It would be nice to have a requirement in there somewhere. The only thing I can think of is, undo. I, I could see it. I could see a denial because the DRB decides in its own dis discretion that the study does not show that it was necessary. Uh, that'd be it. It'd be, I think you'd be arguing about what the study says. Be a pretty bad developer if you just submitted a, a parking study that said you do not need this much parking. <laughs> <laughs> Probably happened. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we know what happened with the, the transit center and that they ended up putting in more parking because um, 
the various tenants felt that it was necessary. And I'm not exactly sure how that was qualified in their application. Um, so it, you know, it has happened in the past where um, there have been modifications to this. I'm just, I'm just concerned if we if we turn Figure Three Dash One Three into maximum parking spaces. Although, you know, that would be a really nice thing to do. I just am worried about what it's going to what's going to happen as a fallout of that. Um, it's already the the case though right now. Pardon me. That's already in existence right now. Three dash one three. The that is currently a maximum right now. It's currently uh, figure three dash one three is currently minimum parking spaces. But if you that, there's a provision to if uh, double that is a maximum. Oh right, yeah, I'm not talking about that. I'm sorry. I thought that what Mike was suggesting is that we turn this figure three dash one three instead of being minimum parking ratios to turn it into maximum parking ratios. In which case, I just don't know what's going to what how that could impact other parts of the ordinance. I think what Mike's suggesting is we don't, it, it currently is a maximum parking uh, requirement if you, it's, it's just that those numbers are doubled. If we remove the minimum parking requirements, they'll be referencing no table unless we add, keep a table in. So I think what Mike's saying is we double those numbers and then just explicitly call them maximums instead of the way it is now. So it would it would change nothing in terms of the, the process and what we currently have for a maximum parking requirement. It would just remove the minimum. I see. Um, yeah. Okay. But still, at, the, at this point, we have not yet discussed taking them out, taking the requirement out completely. Right? Correct. It's the, we, we still have to get to the policy. I was just mentioning it from, from the functional standpoint. I think we could, having taken a look at how our, our rules are written, I think John's proposal to remove minimum could be, it, it's not a huge undertaking to rewrite the parking standards to do that. I think we just, you know, we, we remove point C, which talks about minimum and then we make some adjustments to point D and we make some changes to that table. And I think, you know, so what sounds like a major change to the parking would actually have a minor effect on what's, what's written. The question is now gonna be a policy standpoint. Um, do we think that's a good idea? Um, what, are the, what are the implications of, of not having a minimum parking requirement? Um, you know, sometimes the argument is that this will push additional, um, you know, where somebody doesn't have on uh, off street parking, they may put in additional units, which those units would use on street parking, um, which may be uh, severely constrained in certain areas. And there, there are certain neighborhoods, um, Barry Street obviously has some parking issues. Um, the, the lower sections of Elm Street can have some parking issues. Um, but I think by and large, most I don't see as many problems, but I, I don't live in town, so I don't necessarily yeah. see as, see all the problems that that exist. So, Mike, isn't there a way for um, people who can't meet that parking requirement, particularly downtown businesses, uh, to pay a uh, a fee to the city in lieu of providing the parking? That was under the old zoning. So that's gone completely? That's I didn't gone, realize that. Yeah, that, that was gone completely. And we rewrote when, when this was passed in 2018, Urban Center 1, Urban Center 2, Urban Center 3, and Residential 1500. Those four neighborhoods, or those four zoning districts, were exempted from the minimum parking requirements. Right. Right, I understand that. So but now, now, if, now the transit center did not need to get any approved parking um, for their project when they uh, were they under the new zoning or the old zoning? They made the oh. old zoning. 
Um, so if the training um, center came through today, um, there would be no discussion of um, parking at all. They would they would tell us what they're doing and have to meet any environmental and, and impervious cover requirements, but they wouldn't have to justify meeting a minimum parking standard. Yeah, but isn't that parking waiver available for um, um, occupancies outside of those zoning uh, districts? For example, a multifamily that is located in Res 3000 or Res 6000, um, and they don't have sufficient off-street parking. Weren't they able to also apply for a waiver? Uh, they can apply. A fee? They can apply. There, there is no fee, but there, they can apply for uh, shared parking. So they can make arrangements with another one to to locate somewhere else. So point E talks about shared parking. If you can't um, meet the minimum parking, so we'd have to probably review whether that's even needed. If we didn't have minimum parking, there probably isn't a need for a shared parking requirement, but. Um, there is a discussion of how to do shared parking. And let me see if there are waivers. I do not see waiver requirements in the parking. So um, it looks like you would have to either meet it on uh, the way the rules are written today, you'd have to either meet the minimum or get a shared um, parking arrangement. Mm -hmm. In, in your experience, has this been a barrier for anyone developing multifamily housing? In the past, um, it, it was. It used to come up quite a bit because the way the old zoning worked, and I don't want to dwell too much on the old zoning because it's not here anymore, but the old zoning uh, had it for certain cases in certain ways. And so every once in a while, we would get a project that would come through. I, I can remember one on Main Street in, um, you know, past, past the library, but before the roundabout in that area there, somebody had um, a, an extra unfinished space. And so they wanted to finish that space and put an apartment in it. And it turned out they could do the apartment, they could meet every single requirement, but they didn't have, didn't meet the parking requirement and it didn't qualify for whatever reason, they were one of the technical ones that couldn't qualify for um, the parking waiver. And so they ended up getting kind of caught up because they, they really couldn't meet the parking requirement. And it was a location where they could do a new apartment in the downtown walkable. And that was kind of what everybody said was, Hey, this is, this is downtown It's walkable. I've got a tenant who isn't even looking to bring a car and, and, it kind of got stuck. So it does, you know, certainly in the downtown, it becomes a really big, you know, certainly in the downtown urban center one, urban center two, urban center three, um, you don't want to have the parking requirements that, that absolutely has been the correct decision. Um, sure. We really, should be, we really should be looking for shared parking opportunities, um, parking, uh, public parking opportunities to deal with any parking issues. You don't want everybody to have um, individual parking lots. That's sure, that's yeah. Sub for, for suburban development. Um, right, so we handled that by taking out those minimum requirements for those districts previously. Yeah, and I can so remember another done. project up by the college that, that had some parking issues. Um, they, they had the vacant space, they took a, a carriage house that they renovated and they, and, and it turned out that, you know, having to meet the parking requirements ended up being, ended up being one of the, the barriers to, to putting in that, um, additional unit, even though they, they didn't think there was a big push for it and they could park on street, um, without causing a big problem. And, um, so it does, I would say it does come up periodically. But for the most part, most places, um, I, I, you know, the, as I said, there are kind of these two, two extreme, there, there are three areas. You've got the two extremes. You've got the downtown where we don't want to have the park, the, the, everybody having their own parking. We want to have shared parking. We want to use public parking. We want to use on-street parking because we want to have that density. And we're never going to meet that density if we have a parking space for every unit. On the other, mm -hmm. you have 
the, the lower density areas, uh, the rural areas, the residential 24s, the, you know, those areas there where there's no reason to have on street parking. Uh, you know, everybody's got a single family home, maybe a duplex at most. Um, the requirement is two parking spaces. They can easily fit all of their cars onto their properties. It's just when we start to get to this little bit in the middle that we're, where we start to have some question of whether minimum parkings have value. If somebody wanted to put another eight unit building on Barry Street and was not going to put any park, any uh, off street parking, they're like, I'm just going to, you know, right now I've got a, you know, maybe somebody right now has a eight unit building and they have a parking lot with eight parking spaces. And we change the zoning and they say, awesome, I'm going to take my parking lot and I'm going to put a new eight unit building on there. Um, so now we've displaced those eight parking, those eight cars onto the on street, and we've added another eight cars. You know, that's that's the potential policy implication. Will it happen from an economic reason? I don't know, but um, that would be the the situation where we know Barry Street has a lot of parking problems. Is this is this a uh, something that could cause more problems? And I guess that would be that, that's the question that kind of has to get kicked around and, and decided by you guys, and then I can implement it into into the zoning. Yeah, it seems like this will, will it's unlikely that it'll um, have a, a huge impact in terms of what people currently do and how things are developed. But even if it's like, even if it's like two units, like Mike was saying, you know, that's like two families in Montpelier that we've told they're not welcome here because we think that they need a space to store their car on our property when we have like 15 percent of households in our city that do not own a car like why on earth would we require a space for them to store a huge uh, metal object that they don't own it seems crazy well, not in actually, not in the public interest the the data says that there are quite a few people in montpelier who live in Montpelier and still drive to work in Montpelier. So, I mean, I'm not saying that that's what we should, we should promote, but I just think that this is, I mean, in my opinion, it's extremely elitist of us to say that we don't think that renters should have cars. Um, it would be great if they didn't have cars, and we all want to work towards that, towards that um, possibility of getting rid of cars as much as possible. But we also don't want to tell people, renters, that, oh, God, you can't move here, I realize, because we don't have any parking for you. And if you imagine that there's a family, they've just gone to the grocery store, they're coming home, and they can't park near their unit. So they're going to be schlepping all of this stuff back and forth. Or if they have young children, at least now we can make sure that they have one reasonable parking space um, that's um, available for them near their unit. I mean, it may not be next to their unit, but it will be somehow designated, um, and someone else won't won't have it. Um, I mean, I think it's great. I, I really like the idea of limiting parking and reducing parking, but I think the idea of then pushing it onto the street is not the right move, because it also no. actually makes the streets much more uh, unsafe, frankly. Uh, particularly in residential areas. So, that's, that's Barbara, just, I'm, sorry, I, Barbara, I'm just going to stop you. That is not true um, about about car about streets being unsafe with on street parking. The the likelihood of fatal collisions on streets with uh, on street parking are far lower than they are on streets with without on street parking because travel speeds are much higher. I'm not talking about vehicles. I'm talking about pedestrians. It's more dangerous yes. for pedestrians. That's not true. They, what I'm saying is, is if you're a pedestrian on a street with um, on-street parking, you are far like, less likely to be uh, mowed over by a vehicle because and, and die from it because vehicle speeds are far lower. Well, if you're an adult, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, my concern is kids, you know, crossing the street at any place, which actually does happen. Um, and then on top of that, the other piece that bothers me a lot is just um, what it does to our neighborhoods in terms of moving all of that parking on street. Um, so now, you know, what, 
might have appeared to be maybe a it was a three unit building but it really didn't have a lot of impact on the other single family homes in the area but then once you move that parking on street it's pretty clear what's what's going on and it adds it it really does change quite significantly the characteristic of the neighborhood so it's you know i i mean i, I wrote a note to the transportation subcommittee but um you know i have to say that in 30 years of renting units out in Montpelier, we had six, now seven units, and no one, no one was carless. Now, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't like to encourage that. Oh, and these were all walking distance to downtown. So it doesn't well, mean that we I, wouldn't like to encourage that. Can I jump in for that. a second? Yeah. Yeah, Perfect. so on, on your first point about equity and cost, I think one of the, I was actually thinking about that in the opposite way, um, which specifically to say that, if you have a unit that doesn't have a parking space, you're not going to be able to charge as much for that unit. So there might be a cost saving there. I also think if we're able to promote infill development, I mean, housing in Montpelier is extremely expensive. And if we're able to, pr to promote infill development that might not have been there otherwise, we might be able to get in some additional units. We're working everything we do in that direction, adding additional infill and more units is working to reduce that cost. And I, I have no problems with on-street parking. Um, I recognize that I'm someone who used to live in Chicago and I understand that that's a lot different than Montpelier, but it's also, I, I think part of the reason that we have such a nice downtown and for a, for a town the size that we have, it's amazing that we have the level of density that we have in any case. But I think if we really want to keep encouraging that, this is a way to do that, to help that infill and I don't have any problem with cars on streets. And I think if we can do that and get more housing, we're actually helping people. So what do you say to the family who basically has to park their car a block away and take their groceries to their unit? What do you tell those people? You know, oh, sorry, you just don't, you know, have this extra space. And I, anyway. Um, I find yeah, I just I don't, I don't think having to walk a block is an issue. I just maybe that's just me. And for some people, if they have an accessibility issue, I understand that that might be different. But I just that's, I don't think yeah, that, a, for most people, current, I don't no, think I'm that's a that concern. Also, that's the I current understand. situation now. I feel like that's that's a red herring. Like if, if Montpelier yeah. becomes a successful, if we do grow and we do become more vibrant, have more people. You know, there's an infinite demand for free parking directly next to where you want to go and where you live. And if we're working towards building a community where you don't need to to own and operate a vehicle, then like let's do that. Um, to, to suggest I, that that because we eliminate on street uh, or we eliminate parking requirements that you know the straw man family will not be able to park find a place or rent a place that has um a vehicle that they can park you know right next to their housing unit i don't know just this doesn't i mean you might think it's a straw man but that, I, i'd say that it's probably quite a few families um in who are renting in montpelier you know you've got two young small children and you've got to be able to get back and forth to your car, that, you know, that sort of becomes a, a big issue if you're going to require them to park on the street somewhere. We're not I mean, taking anyone's parking look. units away or requiring anyone to park on the street. We're just saying you do not need to provide, you do not need to build a parking uh, space if you don't need one um, for your, your housing unit or whatever other use you have. Because I think we've shown, like, we have, I don't know what now, 60 years or 70 years of, of data of parking usage and, and we've shown that government is terrible at predicting the amount of needed parking spaces for every single kind of use, yet we just try to try to predict it and it, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well, it just, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense to to you know be so restrictive um in terms of what we're providing for renters for you know because 50 percent of our our people are our renters and that 
means that there is a huge demand right now um, for parking spaces. And we already have a city where visitors come in and say, oh, I can't find a parking space there, so I'm not going to go to that shop. Um, I've heard that from from uh, retail people um, in various locations. It's like people said that they just wouldn't come. So meanwhile, we're going to add to that burden of on-street parking by um, adding in residential units. I mean, the other thing that we did do when we changed the zoning was we allowed for those parking spaces to be to be behind each other. So if you have a long driveway, you could have four parking spaces in it. Um, you know, and, which was not, I don't believe that was the case before. I believe you had to be able to get access in and out. And Brandy definitely wanted to do that, but we said no. But we can have stacked, you know, stacked parking. It just allows for everyone to have a unit off the street. And, um, and then, I mean, you know, not even getting into the whole snow removal thing, because that means that at night in the winter, we only have half the uh, on-street parking available um, because the other half is, uh, is um, forbidden. So, I mean, that becomes a, a, an additional unit, um, excuse me, additional issue. So it just seems that, you know, we're not solving a problem here right now. We could certainly add some language in, which would allow for, you know, if somebody said, I'm building this eight-unit building and I'm marketing it to people, you know, it's they're small units, I'm marketing it to people without cars, um, so therefore I don't need parking. You know, we could um, allow for a waiver situation where they could they would be able to build that building without cars, but uh, without spaces for parking, but to to just automatically say, well, it won't be required, um, you, you, know, you don't even have to pay attention to a prospective tenant. You don't have to care that they might need a certain kind of parking. Um, so I, it just seems, I don't know, as I said, a little bit. Like what, what public purpose are we serving by requiring individuals to create parking spaces whether they need them or not well so the likelihood is that they do need them you don't know who needs a parking space when you're building a building that's right i think there's an equity issue in terms of you know you, john you said earlier we're telling two families we don't want them in montpelier because we're requiring parking instead. I think if you're putting up a bunch of new housing that might be rental housing and you can give people no place for their car and they do have to walk in it, we're not talking about a block, we're talking about across town to the one lot that's available over on Berry Street. Um, and it could be in the winter and it could be people that don't have the, you know, a lot of capability to do that. I think that, that we're telling, people of certain income levels or ability levels that they're not welcome here, in my opinion, if we do it that way. So, so the, what I wanted to chime in on is about that because yeah, there's been a lot of discussion, but I don't think it's, it hasn't been said enough in this discussion that the market will work these things out, that landlords can't, just because government allows it doesn't mean that a business or a, a you know, a developer can do whatever they want. They still have to follow, you know, the economics of it and the finances of it. And they, you know, most people do have cars now. And, and if a developer does not consider that their potential tenants will have cars, then they're going to be at a major disadvantage because there are plenty of the, the rental and the housing that exists right now does provide parking mostly. Uh, and those that don't are, you know, we're going to have a problem of not being able to charge as much rent. That was said earlier, and I think that that's very true. If you look at the rental market right now, a couple of major observations, there's hardly any. Second, they provide parking. That's not the main issue if you're if you're in the rental market right now. So I think the, the market will resolve some of these. So I think that it is... Um, I don't think that it's a big problem that, that that we're all of a sudden going to have 
rentals that don't have parking. I think that's there. There was a leap there in this discussion. I think of like allowing this. And another reason why that I'm not worried about that problem is that bear in mind that m most residential uses right now don't have a parking requirement. There's only a few residential uses on that table, that parking table, that we will be excluding. If if we include commercial, it's actually going to be, I think, a lot more. And and someone correct me if I'm misunderstanding, but this in, is this will impact the commercial uses much more. And I think the concern that was voiced earlier about people coming into shop and not finding parking, I think that's a much more real problem than renters having a problem with parking. Oh, we are we are going to solve parking parking uh, demand and supply with parking minimums. Right. <laughs> I also, on, the, on the downtown, on the downtown piece, Kirby, and Barb, you brought, you brought those, you started this conversation. I just, I want to point out that it's actually significantly better for our downtown that people park and walk past other businesses. They will spend more money if they do that. And I think, I think for the purposes of people who can't walk, it's important to have some spaces, but if, I mean, it's in the benefit of our downtown to have people park in a parking garage and walk all the way down East state or sorry, all the way down state. Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with that. Um, to to um, congregate our parking wherever we can, um, it's just that I would, I would rather not see uh, streets used as for that congregate parking. Um, I yeah, I just um, I just feel so strongly about this. Oh, the issue of of um, the market will adjust. Well, we all know that now currently we have like a one percentage vacancy rate. It's it's very low. So if some of the existing um, landlords decided that they wanted to take out their parking, um, they could point to the zoning ordinance and say, well, yeah, I'm no longer required to do this. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to keep this up. I'm not going to plow uh, or do any of that. So um, it just seems... As if now what we're saying is um, <laughs> we're trying to be someplace like Chicago where where everyone has to park on the street almost. Um, I think, I think like, what you're we, describing is a healthy market, though, where some landlords will decide to build more housing and therefore the city would have more housing. Other landlords would decide not to do that. And then those that provide parking will be able to charge more. And then the tenants would have choices, and that's I mean that's how markets work, and how and 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 how things kind of work themselves out. So it seems like it's not like a horror story. It's just it's fine. It's true if we had a market where there was a higher vacancy rate, where people had choice, but they had very little. I mean, once units come open, they're snapped up, and if we then say, oh well, this one happens to be fall into the category of no parking. Um, then, you know, the, the potential renter may not have any choice because they need someplace to move. So, I mean, if I agree with you that it, it could be a market force issue if we had a 4% vacancy rate, maybe, but not with the vacancy rate that we have currently. It, to me, it doesn't make sense. And as a former landlord, I'll say, you know, I never liked to have to park, provide parking, but I certainly understood why we were doing it. And it felt like the right thing to do. And I guess I'll comment on, uh, you know, in, in light of Kirby's, Kirby's comments, I mean, the, the high cost of free parking, Donald Shoup's, you know, treatise on it, that's, it is quite a book. Um, uh, he's an economist and he was looking at it from from that perspective of trying to decouple the cost of of parking from when he talked about residential from residential units so if, if you're a renter and you're paying 1200 bucks you're paying for a parking space um whether you have a car or not um and, and that's what his conversation was uh and his one of his pushes was to decouple parking from these requirements and and the idea is that the economics would take over that people who don't need parking uh, and don't want parking 
can rent units that don't have a parking requirement or or landlords could let's say that hypothetical landlord i was talking about which doesn't have a minimum parking requirement uh, has an eight unit building and has a parking lot with eight parking spaces he could decouple under this new zoning proposal he could decouple parking from the units and go through and say i have eight units they're for rent instead of for 1200 bucks they're going to be for rent for a thousand bucks and each parking space is 200 bucks a month and you can decide whether you want to buy an apartment and a parking space or just the apartment or just the parking space because you might live two doors down not have a parking space but decide to go two doors down and buy the parking space from that other neighbor because it's available um and we have a, a on sibley street i think there's a there's a um, an old lease that kind of works that way where you have a property which doesn't have parking but there's another lot down the road that has uh, you know parking spaces that are leased back to that other unit um, so that it it, it it basically where he is going is with this economic model that says let's decouple it so people who want parking spaces can buy parking spaces as opposed to requiring everybody who everybody who is a renter in Montpelier is currently paying for a parking space, whether they have a car or not. And that ends up being this vicious cycle of feeding itself that because you have a parking space, you're, you know, it, it ends up feeding the, the more cars, people end up being at a lower density. And, and it ends up requiring that you need a car because we've got lower densities and therefore I need a car to overcome the fact that we have low densities. Um, the, the second comment I wanted to make is, as I was thinking about this proposal and we started talking about commercial, at first I thought commercial would be the important one. And then the more I think about it, the commercial ends up being less important because for the most part, most of our commercial is in the downtown. Our second major area of commercial uh, is, is Route 2, River Street, and Route 302, um, which is still River Street most of those don't have on-street parking and therefore there's really they're gonna they're gonna they can develop however if we said no parking no minimum parking requirements they're they're only hurting themselves they, they can make an economic decision as to how much parking they want in a ratio of parking to building that would be an economic decision for them and they really wouldn't be impacting any neighbors because there's no on-street parking in in any of those areas the only place where commercial again comes back to are some of these mixed use residential neighborhoods or riverfront um and those would be the only ones where where it could have an impact and i and i just say could um so as i started thinking about the commercial i don't think the commercial and industrial minimums make any sense because tractor supply is going to make whatever number of parking spaces that they that they want or think they need the, the issue for them is usually having the city putting a limit on making sure they don't have too much because usually they regulate to the 95th. That's what, you know, you learn in this guy here is that they're regulating to the 95th percentile or 98th percentile. So basically they're building enough parking for the day after Christmas and for, you know, 98% of the year, those parking spaces are empty because they're just built for two days a year. So, um, so I, that, those were the two thoughts that came to mind as you guys were talking about it. I wanted to put put out. Thanks, Mike. Uh, do we have Do we have any other people who want to um, comment? Um, maybe with some priority to Aaron if he has anything. Uh, she isn't, or or Marcella if she isn't. So I I've got to I've got to admit, you guys. I've been having some uh, connectivity issues, so I missed about 10 minutes of this. It sounds like it was really <laughs> So I, I, I don't want to uh, wade into it just because I think I missed a bunch of it. So I, I apologize. Okay, but hey, you missed like the hottest 10 minutes we've had in years. So. Well, that's what it's that's what it's yeah, like. I want to watch Marco. I apologize. I Get apologize. your popcorn. Um, I, okay. I was at, just at this point, like, I feel very um, not tied to commercial. Like, I don't care if downtown has parking next to the business or not. That doesn't bother me. We can do away with those minimums if we want. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel pretty strongly that I'm not going to change my mind tonight about, uh, residential needing some minimum. I, as a renter and as somebody who has not had parking, um, my entire time living in Vermont, I will tell you that, I mean, my, in my opinion, it's not great. It's, it sucks. It, I mean, we're not talking about like, oh, I got to park around the corner. No, it's like a mile walk in a snowstorm to park your car somewhere you're allowed to park it, especially during snow bans. And I don't think, you know, if it's hard for me, it's going to be hard for a lot of other people. So I don't think that it doesn't make any sense to, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I don't want planning to be centered around parking. I don't think we should be using tons of space that could be something else for parking. I understand it's expensive. I just think that it's a, I think, I don't know if I'd say elitist, but I do think that it's um, an opinion to say that, you know, people don't need parking and they'll just figure it out. I don't think that that's ideal, especially in Montpelier where it's a pretty damn small town, really. You know, this is not Chicago. <laughs> this is not Montreal. Yeah, right. This is not New York. People need cars. Um, and people have cars. I just, I just don't feel like my opinion here is like way out of left field. I totally understand the, the problem with parking. Like I've been doing some reading. I totally get it, but not giving people parking near their place or, you know, making it impossible to find another unit in Montpelier with for rent with parking is tough. And I think it limits us. I think one thing we should clarify though, um, cause based on part of what you're saying, uh, you should know that most residential parking is already doesn't have a minimum. So if we change something, well, the, what do you mean? Cause I'm seeing single unit other residential, there's a minimum there. It's the, um, and I mean, maybe I should, I should probably should let Mike being the expert tell us what are the residential categories where there's a parking minimum? Mike? So the easier uh, way of kind of describing it is, um, so those four zoning districts that we talked about, which are really in the core, core, core downtown those zoning districts do not have any parking requirements. Yeah, I looked at those. Outside of that, which is, you know, 90% of Montpelier, you do have uh, requirements for all of the uses. So any of your residential uses, and remember we just had the conversation about you've got the ones that are dwelling units and you've got the ones that are congregate living. So the ones that are dwelling units, which are the ones we're most familiar of? Single family, two family, three family, four family, multifamily. All of those, we have a minimum requirement of one parking space per dwelling unit, which is a very minimum minimum. So for people who have, for, for communities that have minimum requirements, that's a pretty low one. Some of them have a requirement, one parking space for every bedroom. Some of them have two parking spaces for every unit. Um, so they're, they're ones that have minimum parkings that are much higher than what we have we really have about as low of a minimum as you would see, which is just one dwelling unit, one parking space per dwelling unit. Um, but that would be the requirement. The, the, if the amendment passes, the congregate living would be classified by um, FAR floor area ratio because a number of those, um, you know, think of something like heat and woods, you know, how do you calculate the number of cars needed for heat and woods? Um, it's, it's, not really multifamily. It's you know it's a it's a um, it's a senior living facility. Um, so really, the best way to do that is with is with floor area ratio, which is what we use for commercial uses. So, um, but for most of our uses, we're talking about dwelling units, um, and and that's that's what would have it. So if you're on Loomis Street, Liberty Street, you'd have a minimum parking requirement. If you've got a quadplex on Liberty Street, then then you need four parking spaces. And I just wanted us to try to separate 
uh, no one is saying that, um, you know, no one, um, that people aren't going to use vehicles or no one needs cars or I think that's very, that's very different. I think what we're saying is that we will make it legal and possible for something to happen without their needing the, having the provision to build a space, um, for a car. We're, we're just letting that decision be um, put on the landowner. And we, and we do provide on-street parking. And if this is a, 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 a big problem, and, and in a way, it's good, I think, if our parking problem is exacerbated because it means people are coming to Montpelier and if and we can take steps to address that. And that could be uh, by way of a, a parking garage or a lot of different demand management strategies or parking management strategies. Um, but I think by having things like parking minimums, we're not actually doing anything to create any more parking or solve any problems. We're just telling um people that that they can't come here or they can't build a family uh build a housing unit unless they have that space and i think the reality is that's probably not going to change a whole lot we are probably only talking about a handful of situations but i still think it's worth um worth getting rid of it if we can get a few more um households in montpelier would it pertain to existing buildings, Mike? And if that change was made, would it pertain to existing multifamily? This is what I'm hearing in the examples. Mike, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I just Hi. figured that out. Yep. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, it, it would. Um, you know what? I, I, I won't 100% jump in because there's some things that may there may be a condition of a permit, so I don't want to give anyone in the public a sense that that they would automatically not be able to, because if there was a project that had previously been approved that had a condition in the permit that said they had to have a certain number of parking spaces, then those those limits would remain. But if you were, you know, a, you know, a historic six unit building that had six parking spaces, um, and then the zoning change to say you don't have a minimum parking, then yeah, technically they don't have to keep those six parking spaces. They could turn their parking lot into a lawn. They could, if they had enough impervious cover or whatever else, if they meet all the other requirements, they could put another structure on it. Um, you know, they could reuse that parking lot for something else. Um, that, that, that would be true. Okay, uh, so I think we need to we need to wrap up the discussion because we actually do have an item after this, and we want to make sure that we get a, a vote on for for the for the sake of the public hearing because it's you know obviously it's not just parking. So um, yeah, if anyone has any final or original things, um, let's go ahead and 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 do that, and then if not, uh, we can start thinking about a motion. Uh, and I think that just procedurally, it might be a good idea for us to try a motion on, well, we can talk about it, but, but I, I, um, I know in the past when we've had different options, people haven't liked that, but we've explored every option. So I just want to put out there that there's the option of doing it with all commercial only or, or getting rid of all parking minimums or just the residential mm -hmm. ones uh, everyone should keep in mind those all those options when we go to vote and talk about which version you would prefer and with that um uh, do we have any like final comments well i know i've had way more than my um my share of discussion on this um but i will use just one example um i live on liberty street and we have currently have parking on both sides, which means that it's great traffic calming because, you know, only one car can go through at any time. But I live within a block of the elementary school. So during the times when school's in session, our street is, you know, covered with parking that's being that's produced as a result of 
teachers that need to, you know, come to, to school and all of those various issues. So we already get that overflow parking, overflow from the on-street parking. So what happens then is what would happen if, if all of the, if the increase, there was an increase in number of units along here, and then all of a sudden the people who were living here, and if they were going to rely on on-street parking, they're getting pushed out. So it's not like we have a lot of, of choices. We just don't have, you know, we don't have a parking structure. We don't have a lot of, we don't have off-street parking lots where people can park um, legally. So anyway, I will stop. <laughs> Thank you, Corby. I, I agree that, you know, the options is a good way to look at it. Um, we might want to vote on options. Okay. Uh... Yeah, uh, by the way, I used to live on Luma Street closer to the school than Liberty, but everyone had off street parking, so it didn't affect my life that the streets were all busy during school hours, by the way. <laughs> Just, um, yeah. but, you know, totally anecdotal. Uh, so, okay. Uh, uh, let, me, let me first ask, uh, you know, um, what people are the most interested in? Do you, are you the most interested in, in um, uh, getting rid of the par minimum parking requirements, changing the table to maximum, keeping the maximums, but getting rid of those parking requirements for everything? I take it. I mean, I, I, I sense that John and Stephanie, and and I'll put myself in that group, are in support of of getting rid of all of the parking requirements. Um, but what are um, other thoughts about it? I know, I know, Barb, you would be opposed to it. Marcella mentioned that she doesn't like anything that that touches the residential part. Um, Aaron, wh wh where are you at, Aaron, so that we know what kind of? And and Stephanie, also, I I made an assumption about where you stand, so feel free to to let me know that too. No, that, that's fair. I mean, I sorry, Aaron, you can go first. No, I was just going to say, I, I think I echo a lot of Marcella's concerns about this. I mean, I think fundamentally, you know, you, without getting into the weeds too much, um, I guess I would just agree with the general tenant that the commission should be, would, should be wary of tinkering with parking regulations as a way to, that has, um, impacts whether intended or not that it, it sort of i guess for lack of a better term sort of creates social engineering within the town um and you know if if the if the town wants to uh institute policies and programs that try to get people less dependent on cars and encourage less car use that's great but i don't think parking is a mechanism we should use to do that today so okay. i guess i would say that's what we're doing today that's what we've done yeah i i, I agree with that that trying to regulate parking is actually the social engineering i think I, I think leaving it alone is the whatever the opposite elitist is thing uh, but the thing we, you just we, said Sorry, Kirby. The thing, the thing you just said, everyone on my street had off street parking, so it didn't matter to me. It didn't affect my life that the parking got busy on the street during the day. Well, I was I was I was subtly making the point that 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 some of the problems that Barb's bringing up in her hypotheticals aren't actually problems. That but was no, but was you, you, you illustrated my point in that you owned a house or maybe you rented. No, 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 I was, I was a renter and all the, but all the, all of the properties around that part of Luma street and Liberty street, have parking. There's a lot, there's a lot of rentals. There's a lot of rentals, but they all have off street parking already. So, sure. but if we're going to try to create a community that doesn't have that, then when you do have other things that put pressure on on street parking, including snow, the people who don't have the off street parking are the ones that are going to be, you know, it does affect their life. I mean, to say that like, well, I have off street parking, so I'm good is not. I see, I, I, yeah, I see what you're saying. I just, I don't see us making this parking change as actually resulting in a whole lot of new development. I just don't see that as a, a likely at all. Then why so are I don't you, why see are you doing it? Because it might, because it, it might allow some more units. 
and and also gets us out of the business of trying to have the city decide what parking needs exist when we're not actually capable of doing it. Uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of non-developed stuff downtown that doesn't have requirements for parking. And what would what would Saban's pasture look like if there's no street parking over there? What if they decided not to do parking? It's an awkward lot. It'd be easier if they didn't. We, we know that they are, though. We've heard about what they're planning. <laughs> it's, and, and it's not, it's not, it's not that the city's require. I, I think if you asked, if Dave or Solari, you asked him, like, why are you providing parking and what, what's being proposed or, 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 or whoever the developers are? I don't think it's not him, but you know what I mean? If we, if we ask, I think what they'll say is, well, in order to be competitive, we need to provide parking because, you know, we're yeah. not going to we're not going to do as well financially on this if if we don't if we if you know we're going to lose customers if, if we don't provide parking that's why we're doing it but if that's the case then why are we saying like if i have a choice if the consumer is choosing parking why are we saying we're going to get rid of the parking though because if we know that feels like an argument that can't support <laughs> here's what I, I think we really need to separate we're not saying that you don't need parking. We're not saying don't develop parking. We're just not telling you what the minimum is. We're, we're letting people decide that. And the reality is most of the time people will build and people have built more parking than they need. So that removing this requirement, you know, probably isn't going to have a big impact, but it might allow for the creation of a few more units and that's why i think um it's worth it we're starting we're not starting from the premise of um i think we start from the premise that people you know can develop their properties and then we identify reasons or, or things that are in our collective interest for having these these different regulations that we pass um, but I don't think parking is one or, or, or um, a parking on their, their properties is one where we are in a good position to figure out what that minimum is. Okay. So yeah. for, the, for the purposes of time, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Stephanie, and then I'll, and then I'll try to lay out some options for us as far as moving forward. Oh, I think that was Barb. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, she yeah. was rebutting. Yeah. She was rebutting John. Well, in that case, let me let me like try to move us forward before we because I mean, you know, we of course we yeah. can all uh, we can rebut all night. Uh, yeah. So so a few options here, and tell me tell me what you think as a group. We could discuss this more, as I was just saying. Uh, um, it, what it would mean is you know any action would be put off to the next time we send some recommendations to the city council. So those especially those in favor of making a change in this area would you like to just table this discussion and bring it up later Ariane will be part of the discussion she'll have a chance to participate which is a factor um and and we can talk and we can talk about the residential aspect or we could try to vote tonight but it sounds like there's only three votes for um getting rid of all minimum parking uh, so we would, if we did it tonight, it sounds like we could maybe get rid of minimum parking for commercial uses, but not the residential that exists, unless Aaron or Marcella decide to change. That's kind of the landscape we have. So what do people want to do? Well, I, I, uh, I would be in support of tabling it um, so that we can get more real data and information before we act on it. Well, I think at this point, I mean, functionally, I think we're going to have to table it anyway. I don't think we're going to get anything passed. Um, but I do one other thought that's spinning around in my head. I just want to say that, I, Marcella, I hear what you're saying. I don't disagree with some of the arguments that you're making at all. Um, I just, I think in this case, I'm not sure that this is the right policy to fix the issue that you're talking about. I'm not sure that it's actually having that impact. I mean, if you don't have a parking space now, then it, it, it didn't help. 
So I'm not sure if that's really, I'm not sure this is really the right solution. I'm, I certainly lean towards something like a parking garage downtown that people could park in overnight when it's snowing, but I just don't think that this is going to fix the, the, the problem that you're having. Yeah, I'm trying to think right now of other kind of like, I, you know, yeah, but I also I also think part of my part of what if I have a hesitation, it's around the new winter parking policy. So now if you have a car and you have to park on the street, you have to move your car every single day, <laughs> which is like if you don't normally drive your car, that's a lot different than just having to move it when there's a snowstorm, which is only an occasional thing as opposed to now having to switch the side of the street that you're on every single day. I mean, I don't think that that policy specifically considered people who actually had to park on the street. Okay. No, because it was assuming that there was an off-street parking requirement for residential. Right. I think that that policy assumed that people were parking not on the street at night, which is not specifically yeah. the case. Okay. Let's. Uh, what, what do you say? We um, is, is everyone okay with? Uh, you know, we'll remove this uh, from our consideration for for this round, and we'll put this on the agenda for next week, or next meeting, I should say. So. Sorry, minor thing to add to that. Um, I will not be at the next meeting. So I apologize for that. My husband won't be home, so I'll have a two-year-old running around and he doesn't like being ignored very much anymore. He doesn't like well, Kate Hart. <laughs> no, he doesn't. No. Yeah, he would love to participate, <laughs> but I'm not sure you guys would appreciate that. <laughs> oh, sure we would. Yeah. <laughs> In, in in that case, I, I think I don't know if we're if we're going to do something with this. We it should probably be one where where everyone's here. Um, so uh, maybe not on on next time's agenda then, but but in the next in the next few, if that's and, and since John, I want to ask what John's thoughts are since he brought this up in the first place, and if he feels like he's that we're being dismissive by by putting it off a few meetings. What do you think, John? I I got. Uh the way for a minute um but uh sorry what was your question yeah the, the the question is like are you okay with uh with putting this off um and having us uh, renew the discussion in a few weeks where hopefully everyone's uh there uh so it won't be next meeting stephanie's missing but but in a, in a future meeting where we can have everyone discuss it and maybe uh vote then oh yeah of course I've been advocating for this for like four or five years now, so I'm in no rush. So you have time to wait. Okay. Uh, we're, doing, okay. we're doing a little bit better about having updates on a regular basis. So if, if the, you know, the parking won't make it into this round of updates, but if we have a conversation about it, we can then have something developed. If we're going to make changes, we can have something developed and, and well thought out. That'll go in the next round of zoning fixes. Um, you know, probably be late in 2021, um, just because we, we tend to have these things cycle um, through with the zoning administrator. So, okay, let's let's pencil it in for the first uh, the first meeting of February. Uh, it's gonna be. I can actually look. Oh, it's not like calendars on computers don't exist. Uh, February eighth. Uh, so let's tentatively plan for that. Hopefully everyone will be here. Hopefully everyone who has a position can bolster their, they can dig in because that helps. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk. Get the octagon ready. Yeah. So we can, we can talk more there and people can, can do more independent research. Okay. So with that, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's get a vote for the other, um, changes, um, and Mike, why don't you, well, no, that's not appropriate to have you tell us what to, what to motion <laughs> here. Uh, let's see. I'll, I'll do it. Uh, do we, do we have a motion, uh, to propose for the city council to make the, uh, changes as briefed by Mike earlier in this conversation, but excluding any changes to zoning that, that were not briefed by Mike. I'll uh, second. Parking. Okay. Can you make the can't you make the motion, Kirby? Or would you rather have us do it? Uh, 
Why don't you do better it? to have somebody else do it? Yeah. All right, all right. Um, I'll make that motion. Ooh, I'll second it. Yeah. Okay. So we have a motion from Barb, second by Aaron. Again, this is you know to, to move to make the changes that that Mike briefed us on, but but to not change parking other than. That's, I know it's complicated, but Mike did make some minor changes to parking and what he briefed, and we do want to make those changes, just not anything more. So maybe it might be just clearer to say that the motion is to forward the proposed draft to the city council for consideration. Does the proposed draft have something regarding parking? I mean, it, does, outside, but not, not the min, it doesn't affect the minimum parking. Okay. It was the proposed draft that you guys were presented. Okay. Uh, so we have we have a motion from Barb and a, and a second from Aaron. I think we all understand what we're doing. Uh, those in favor of uh, the motion. Oh, is there any discussion? Just stop it there. Anyone interested in discussion for that motion? Okay. Those in those in favor uh, of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we're moving. We're moving that the batch of proposed changes to the city council, uh, and that ends the public hearing aspect of our discussion. Uh, and what's left on the agenda is um, a brief. I, and if you guys need, if we want to kick this to the next meet to the next meeting, that's totally fine. But the the continuity structures subcommittee, we're going to give us an update. We had received uh, about a month ago an Excel spreadsheet from Marcella. Do you guys feel like you have enough time to go over that or do you want to put it off? I feel like we could probably do it quickly, but I don't know, it is 730. Um, uh, let's just I, I mean, I think we're all we're all worn out. Let's let's put it off, and we'll we'll do it first thing next meeting. Um, yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Can I ask one question? Yeah. Um. So I've been I've worked on because I know you guys were working on kind of how to restructure the the implementation in in your table there. Um. But I've been working on uh, just to put together the actual draft chapter for historic resources, just as a way so we can start to get that framed. Would what would you guys like me to do with that draft chapter that I pulled together? I've tried to just kind of come up with a framework, something that we would use as a as a template that we would kind of repeat. Do you want me to have historic preservation committee take a look at it first? Do you want the the continuity and structure subcommittees take a look at that first. Do the planning commission want to take a look at that first? What what would be your thought? This would be a chapter like that would go into the final. Yeah, it would be the compendium. I mean, we're, we're, like we eventually want to have a web for this to be a web document. So this would okay. be basically the text of the web page, and then at the end of that is the link to the implementation strategy that you guys have already been working on. Um, and that we've been working on all this implementation strategies. We now just have to write 10 or 12 chapters as well. Yeah. Um, but I feel like Stephanie and John maybe correct me, but I feel like we kind of had thoughts about how we wanted the chapters to look. So maybe we should look at it before. I don't want to be a bottleneck though. Yeah, I, I, I also think it would be helpful um, for either the continuity group or the planning commission to take a look so that we can make any edits before you start doing other chapters so that we can use this one as an example. Yeah, I think because we just had, I feel like we had opinions earlier about what we wanted them to look like. So maybe that would be a good first step. Okay, so yeah, if you guys could, I mean, I'll send it out. Is it, it's Marcella, Stephanie, and John? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can send it out to you guys. And if you guys have a subcommittee meeting, um, just tag me into it if you don't mind. And I can um, kind of get get in on that so I can see what you guys are thinking at for structure. Um, because eventually over the next six, eight months, we've got to 
work work out the the 10 or 12 chapters as well as wrap up the last of the implementation strategies so we'll have our work cut out but if i've got a template then i can start to throw that at a few people to work on okay so i will send that to you thanks thanks mike <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, th that works out well. We'll uh, we'll we'll hear we'll hear from that group at the next meeting. Hopefully, you guys will have time to also go after this, go over this draft chapter, and um, so that'll give you a good example, so that it kind of comes becomes more concrete for us, like what your what your ideas are. Uh, so that that sounds good. Um, so with that. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, moved by Stephanie. Do you have a second? Second. Second by Marcella. Uh, all in favor of adjournment? Say aye. 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 Okay, so we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Very you. interesting. Thanks. Great to meet you. Yeah. Have a good birthday week. Thanks, Kirby. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, happy birthday, Mike. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I mean, 32? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? My 20th anniversary of my 32nd birthday. Awesome. That's pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> well, enjoy it. Yes. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.